thank you so much to uh, Radha and Jochen to um, join us uh, and give us uh, a sense of this wonderful book they put together after a conference uh, with the same title. Um, both um, Radha and Jochen are uh, associate professors uh, of Islamic art and architecture um, and of art history at VCU Qatar. Um, Professor Dalal um, has worked on the Ottoman Empire and British India, looking at the print cultures around um, the Khilafat movement uh, in um, the early 20th century. Um, Professor Sok Sokoli has worked on uh, early Islamic caliphates, inscribed textiles in the, in the context of court administration and manufacture. He's also worked on 18th century British India, especially the botanical paintings of the Indian painter Zain ad -Din from the collection of the, of the scholar uh, Sir William Jones uh, and the Royal Asiatic Society, uh, as well as um, the Daniels um, who traveled around and made these wonderful um, drawings. Um, I'm, um, I'm very, very pleased to have both of these um, art historians with us to tell us about something that we often um, don't hear about in our Georgetown campus, uh, which is art history. Um, we, like, we have a major called culture and politics, and we like uh, students to be more interested, and they are interested in art and art history, but it's not uh, something that we offer courses on regularly. And hopefully that's an area where, you know, the multiversity framework can actually help us um, in gaining this kind of understanding. And hopefully today is the, the beginning of many um, future collaborations. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. We are very, very pleased to have you and um, over to you. Thank you very much that was for the very warm welcome there, Day. And I agree with you. You know, let's uh, see what uh, this initial um, event might bring for the future uh, in terms of collaborations between the two institutions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen, and we can begin. Um, um, all right, so. The, so I'll just sort of begin with a very brief history of what this is. And so the, the season of mobility of Islamic art is the title of the proceedings of the conference that we held in 2019. It was published with Yale University Press in 2021. Um, and the conference is uh, uh, the Hamad bin Khalifa um, Symposium on Islamic Art, which has been running since 2004. And it was a, a collaboration between Qatar Foundation, VCU Arts Qatar, and VCU Main Campus in Richmond, Virginia. And we had uh, two prominent scholars in the field of Islamic art, uh, Sheila Blair and Jonathan Bloom, who were in charge of the symposium for a long while um, until about um, 2018 when they stepped down. Um, and that's when uh, my colleagues, uh, Professor um, Jochen Sokoli and Sean Roberts, who were both at VCUQ at that time, uh, were invited along with myself to uh, develop the symposium further. And we decided to do a few things differently. Um, one was to create an open call for papers um, and panels, um, and then to also invite a body of fellows um, to present um, cutting edge work uh, that they were um, conducting research on at that time. So the book is a culmination of um, some of the best papers that were presented at the time and includes both established scholars um, and um, emerging scholars who, who are coming through um, in the uh, field of Islamic art. Um, we decided to focus on the season, the mobility uh, of Islamic art because it's been something that has come up in various ways in different um, spheres of research, uh, but perhaps not quite uh, together as you know, its own um, uh, topic for some of these larger conferences on Islamic art. And we didn't want to limit it to any particular region or any particular period. And so we decided to go fairly broad um, in inviting uh, scholars to present and so the range is quite spectacular, um, starting all the way from the beginnings of um, Islam, uh, all the way to uh, present time um, and contemporary uh, mosque architecture, for example, 
uh, as well as um, artist interpretations of things that are happening in the geopolitical sense around the world. Um, and so that's um, sort of the, the gist of kind of the entirety of the book um, as it came, um, uh, as it developed, as it coalesced. Um, I invite Jochen to add anything further to that. Uh, we can't hear you. Yes, sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, so, so th this conference was fundamentally different to the conferences beforehand. And as Rata said, I think the important thing was that it provided an open forum um, in a way that it hadn't done before. Um, and so, um, so the spread of papers, I mean, obviously, when you organize a conference with a call for papers, you don't know what you're going to get. Um, um, but we got a, a quite a large um, body of, of contributions. And then the book, as Arata said, is a culmination of or sort of the is sort of the, the, the uh, pairing these down to the to the very best, but at the same time, um, providing sort of breadth um, across the board. And I think that's what's really nice about the book because it's not fixed on any particular period or area. Um, and um, so I think that's, that's what makes this stand out from the previous um, volumes that, 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 um, that were published in connection with the symposium. Um, and so what you're seeing here, the image on the screen is actually um, the frontispiece of the book itself, but we chose this particular image, um, which is uh, uh, an installation at MoMA. This particular one is an installation at that was at MoMA in New York. Um, that is a Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, from 2016. There are different versions of the Woven Chronicle uh, by Rina Sainikalat. Um, and this one clearly, of course, sees the Mercator projection of the world map uh, on the wall. But what she has done using uh, electrical wiring uh, is to create these connections uh, from continent to continent, city to city, across uh, bodies of water, across land, uh, that symbolize migratory patterns. But if you'll notice, and you take a closer look at it, you will see that the electrical wire is knotted as if to turn it into barbed wire. And again, suggestive of the idea of the um, impermeability of many of these artificially constructed borders that divide humanity instead of uniting us in the way that we um, should be united. Um, in later versions of this work, she has also sort of um, upended the Mercator projections um, insistence on you know, suggesting that the North somehow is uh, more powerful uh, compared to the South and also you know, trying to correct some of the uh, inaccuracies in the Mercator projection. And so she's flipped it around to give what we would now call the global South prominence up in the North. Um, and this particular work, I think, is really evocative of the kind of things that we were um, grappling with when we brought this symposium together is, you know, um, in 2019 or 27 to 2018 to 2019, as we were planning for the symposium, of course, there was uh, much uh, in the news about um, the migrations that were taking place from war-torn um, places across the Middle East, across you know um, Africa, other places as well, uh, across uh, the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, uh, and the Mediterranean in particular, and so it was particularly. Uh, uh, poignant for us to to sort of consider, you know, how do we bring this connection about, you know, in terms of the different kinds of mobilities that exist uh, throughout history and all the way up to the present. Yes, and so this is one of the maps that was 
that was in the book. Um, and when we think about the Islamic world, of course, um, and its, its material culture, I mean, this, is, this map is, is really focusing on the Indian Ocean, but we could extend this, of course, also to the Mediterranean. Um, and in, in, in historic, in history, of course, in, in, in previous times, the, the, the connections, um, kind of Islamic world was at the center of a huge trade network um, and exchange network that stretched all the way from China and all the way to, to Western Europe and included parts of Africa. Um, and also some of the Pacific Rim Islands. So an enormous um, kind of sphere of, of interactions of people, of goods, um, and of, of course, with all of that, of, of also with ideas. And um, so this map, I think this map shows you particularly the sea routes. Of course, there were also land routes, um, which are not indicated here because the focus here is, is the sea connections. Um, but those were interlinked exchange networks um, in many ways, not so different to the networks that exist today. And so when we think about our globalized world, and we always think about our world being so global and so um, international, um, well, that was also the case in the past. It was the case also in the very distant past. These migrations, of course, have been part of human history since the advent of humanity. Um, and with those migrations came the migrations of new technologies, ideas, and materials. So all of that is, in a sense, a kind of a package, I would call it. Um, and that's why I think this is, this is so poignant, in a sense. Um, and maybe we go to the next yeah. one, Radha. Yes. So the images you see here, um, they were chose, they, 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 they came from the introductory chapter. Um, and they the the two manuscript pages are from a very well-known manuscript of the Maqamat of Al-Hariri, which was copied um, in Baghdad in the 1230s um, by a very well-known scribe and painter. And it's, it's, a, it's a literary work that kind of reflects the various connectivities of the Islamic world. And it's sort of, it's hinged on the adventures of um, its hero and all the different places that he went. And of course, these two images are really quite interesting because they, they embark on this adventurous journey across the sea um, on an Arabian type of ship um, and then land on this miraculous island, which is inhabited by miraculous creatures um, in most likely in the Indian Ocean. So, and then the center image is a much more recent, um, it's a, re well, it's not that recent, a, an early 20th century photograph of, um, of Dows, which were used across the coast of Africa, across the coast of India, the Gulf, the, the Persian Gulf Coast, um, and ships which ventured all the way to China, which were ocean going and carried enormous amounts of cargo um, and people. And so the kind of correlation of these historic images and a much more, um, well, a, an image that 
is much much closer to our time. Um, kind of gives you the I, you know, the, the 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 notion that this has been going on for a very long time, um, and particularly Iraq and the Persian Gulf, but also the Red Sea, of course, were very much at the center, the entry points um, for this, for these connections um, to the Islamic world. So um, so if you want to uh, turn it over to Radha, yeah, um, and so I think that's that's a, a great you know segue into um, what we ended up doing with the volume itself. That that introduction of you know the images that you saw from the Makamat, but also the idea of you know um, Doha itself as uh, a conduit uh, for the seafaring um, peoples of the time, you know from very early uh, times on. Uh, we were looking at the ways in which that we might be able to um, scaffold the entire volume so that there are some themes that work really well together. Um, and so it's divided up into three sections, the materials of mobility, uh, where there is discussion of lapis lazuli, emeralds, um, glass as materials, uh, port cities and centers of production. Um, we're looking at Basra as a port city um, and ceramic production there, as well as um, the uh, ports of um, Mocha and um, Aden in Yemen uh, and the role that they played in um, welcoming pilgrims from uh, South Asia, for example, on their way to the Hajj. Um, and then uh, bringing it to more contemporary times in terms of migration and um, diaspora, sort of looking at uh, the ways that the seas have been involved in migratory patterns um, all the way across, you know, from Arabia to China, um, and then looking at partitions that, are take, that took place um, in the early 20th century, uh, especially between Turkey and Greece. Uh, and the impact that that had on visual culture of the time. So even though we have these sections sort of kind of neatly delineated, um, the there are there's a central th thread basically that goes through the entire volume that is of course related to the idea of mobility across um, bodies of water. Um, but we've focused on um, different things, you know, people, ideas. Uh, as well as objects, and that's what you will see in the presentation today. And so I begin with um, something that we put into the introduction of the volume um, to sort of underscore the, you know, we, we can talk about um, mobility in, in all sorts of different ways. You know, there's, there's sort of the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, but we wanted to bring to light you know, some of the things that often get kind of sidelined when we're talking about certain types of mobility, uh, which is the, not only the mobility of goods and you know, luxury items, as you can see in the Dutch still life painting on the left uh, on the screen, uh, but also the movement of people, um, but movement of people in a forced sense and not voluntary. And so what you're seeing here on the left, of course, is what the Dutch um, used as a way to sort of project an idea of their wealth and their um, possessions. Uh, this painting is from the late um, 17th century. Uh, it's after the upheaval in um, the 1640s in China had sort of abated for the porcelain trade to uh, recontinue. But the problem, of course, at that point was that the porcelain that was so coveted coming in from China, the, the blue and white porcelain, um, had faltered uh, during the 1640s uh, trouble in uh, China. And so the Dutch had started uh, creating uh, Delftware at home in imitation, which then uh, became a luxury item in its own. And so, uh, here you see that sort of being uh, projected as, you know, um, a status item in the painting. 
But behind those uh, two, uh, the jar and the, the ewer that you see at porcelain is of course uh, a person uh, who uh, most likely came from uh, perhaps Northern Africa uh, as uh, a slave uh, to the Dutch uh, uh, metropole and uh, is incorporated into this painting as a prized possession. And this kind of, you know, points to again sort of the the problematic side of studying um, the mobility of luxury items um, and um, art objects during the early modern period in particular. Uh, as you can see from the image on the right, uh, this was a monument uh, erected in honor of the Medici family, uh, one of the most famous mercantile families uh, uh, during the, the Renaissance and early uh, Baroque period. Um, so famous, of course, you know, that there is an entire, I think, um, Netflix series on, on them. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jochen. Uh, but they, they dedicated a monument um, to, you know, their success in trade um, coming from Africa, coming from Asia, uh, through the Middle Eastern ports uh, up into Italy at the time. And uh, they wanted to, in particular, showcase that uh, their trade involved of uh, bringing in slaves. And so you can see, of course, here, um, the uh, sculptural form of a slave wearing shackles that's attached to this particular uh, monument. And so this has not been, you know, um, far from our minds as we um, go through the, the volume, that you'll see it come up in different ways uh, in terms of, you know, not just the movement of commodities, but also the movement or the forced movement of people. So the, the, the section in the book on the materials of mobility included papers by Heather Coffey on collapsing geography and orientalizing pigment um, in a 14th century chromosphere, Italian painting wow. and Ilkhanid ceramics. Um, another was on the presence of Chinese textile in Namlu tombs. Um, as evidence for maritime trade and cultural exchange in the 14th century um, by Irene Shea. And then Marika Serda um, talked about emeralds in India as new world gems at the Mughal court. And Tara Desjardins um, looked at the evolution of Mughal glass um, as evidence of tracing trade in the connections between India and Britain. So I will go, I will have a look at, we will have a look at some of the visuals that um, these, these papers um, used. And here, for example, in this painting by Duccio, um, which was part of, um, of Heather Coffey's Paint, uh, Heather Coffey's um, paper. Um, very prominent, of course, is all the gold all around, which is something that goes back to Byzantine traditions. But right in the center is the Madonna seated on a throne with the Jesus child in her arms, um, wearing a deep blue overcoat or a, um, a well, deep blue. Um, mantle. Dress. mantle, exactly. And the blue, of course, is the key here because the blue was came from very far away. And if we go to the next slide, so the blue in in painting was um, produced from a mineral called lapis lazuli, which came from Afghanistan, and it still comes from Afghanistan today. Um, it is a mineral that needs to be refined. It's a conglomerate mineral. In fact, it's the, the crystals sit in um, a substrate of quartz, 
Um, and here also with um, traces of pyrite. Um, so if you want to refine, if you want to grind up all of that, of course, you'll end up with um, a rather coarse powder. So that needs to be refined. So the mines for these material, for this mineral, were in Badakhshan. And it is from there that lapis was traded to the Islamic world. Um, well, it actually was already traded in Roman times because some of the most iconic um, Roman paintings, for example, in Rome, in, um, in one of the underground rooms of uh, a now vanished villa, a whole garden is painted with a blue sky, a sky blue background, which was made of lapis. So this trade continued into the Islamic period, and it was from the Islamic world that the raw pigments then were traded further to Europe. And it was artists such as Duccio, but also Giotto, who used it profusely in their works. Giotto, for example, you think about the Arena Chapel uh, in Padua, the whole ceiling is painted in this with this blue pigment, and they must have used tens of kilos of it, which probably cost a lot more than gold. So the, the this mineral, which is sort of doesn't really look like anything, is actually incredibly important um, as a material, and it's it's, it's the way it is used in these works of art speaks to their importance. It raises their value, it raises their importance, and it draws the, the viewer um, to what the artist wants you to see. And in this case, the Madonna, um, clad in the most expensive item that you could imagine. And this would have been clearly visible to people at that time. Um, now, similarly, um, textiles and silk, of course, was also a commodity that was that was highly prized um, in the Islamic world and then also in Europe. Um, came from China, of course. And the trade had already in silk had already existed um, in Roman times and then in Byzantine times. But it was during the Mongol period, and the Mongols were incredibly good tradesmen that established a really effective network of trading posts and administration to market these textiles across Asia and further on to Europe. And it's at that time, and it's also the time of Duccio, of course, um, the artist we've just seen, that um, traders from Italy particularly traveled to the Mongol world and, and, and brought back examples of silk, which then sparked off the Roman industry in Italy. The Mamluks in Egypt at that same time were also incredibly fond of silk. And with their um, connections to the Mongol world, because they were at war with the Mongols for a very long time, but with war, there also comes connectivity. Um, and so the Mamluk traders imported silks from China, um, which is evidenced here by the presence of Chinese silks, inscribed Chinese silks, um, that were discovered in um, burials in Cairo. Um, 
and then started copying them. And sometimes it is incredibly difficult to distinguish which silk is Chinese and which silk fabric is Mamluk. Um, the painting here, uh, it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of visual reminder um, of the presence of these silks in the court context. And so when you find them in burials, of course, they had been worn previously during life. And so here in this um, 14th century manuscript of the Kalila Wedimna, um, the couple embracing is covered in a cloud in a certain a red silk with blue cloud designs, which are very reminiscent mm -hmm. of one of those silks from the same period, from the 14th century, um, that 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 um, were produced in China. So, shall we go to the next one? And then Tara, um, uh, sorry, um, Marika Sadas paper on emeralds was very interesting because it brought in the new world, of course, and also took us into a time that was a little closer to ours, um, the 17th century, the early 17th century, and the Mughals in India. Um, the Mughals, of course, were very fond of gems. Um, they imported pearls, for example, from the Gulf, and they mined gems in India. India is, is very rich in terms of um, gems, um, but th there was a lot more demand than supply. And so the discovery and colonization of South America and the discovery there of large deposits of precious stones um, opened up huge new markets. And the connections, of course, the, between um, the Mughal court and particularly the Portuguese enabled the Mughals to tap into this new resource. Um, and the Portuguese being extremely good traders, of course, saw that there was an opportunity. So in fact, many of the emeralds that were carved in and around the Mughal court came from South America, particularly from Colombia. And they were so highly prized that, for example, here um, in, in the, uh, you see the, in this, the little square-shaped um, carved emerald, an inscription um, in the name of Jahangir. So there were sort of incredibly highly prized possessions that were personalized. They became part of necklaces, and you can see here from the miniature, and they were carved in the, 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 with the sort of in the aesthetic value um, of, of, of Mughal, um, Mughal design, um, flowers, and, and um, particularly very naturalistic flowers. And there is, as you can see here in the, the rounded um, piece used in a later brooch. Of course, these emeralds had a very long afterlife, as you can also see that they were then, of course, acquired um, later on by European um, collectors and turned into um, European jewelry. Cartier particularly was one who bought a lot of uh, Mughal uh, carved emeralds in India and incorporated them into his Art Deco designs. So again, a mineral, um, material which has no intrinsic value that becomes an, a carrier of all of these associations. And then in Tara's, Tara Desjardins paper, um, it is glass, which is made of silica. Um, 
But the Mughals were fascinated um, by glass because of its translucent qualities. And when the British brought glass to India, um, the Mughals saw a great opportunity to, to kind of turn this material into something new. And you can see it with the hooker, the hooker base here in this emerald blue, uh, sorry, emerald green with a gilded design. It's almost jewel-like. So again, here the interaction between um, two cultures creating something new. Um, and so did you want to add more to that no I think no I think I think yeah I think that's that's good yeah now I was just thinking in the interest of time we might move along a little bit faster yeah. so people have uh, a chance to ask us some questions so the second um, section of the book is on port cities and centers of production. And we selected two of the papers from that section um, to highlight for this presentation. Um, the first one is Jessica Hallett's uh, on the um, city of Basra as a center of mobility and innovation. This is during the Abbasid period, which is basically the second um, uh, Islamic dynasty uh, to rule uh, over this region. And then uh, the one after that is by Professor Nancy Elm, uh, who is looking at manuscript paintings um, and uh, related to the pilgrimage, uh, the Hajj pilgrimage. So um, I'll hand it back over to Yakin so he can discuss the ceramics. So the important thing here is with Jessica Hallett's paper, Jessica Hallett's doctoral thesis was, was on Basra as the center of um, the production of Abbasid ceramics. And, Previously, you know, it had been thought that these ceramics were produced in different places. One was Samara, one was Baghdad, perhaps. Um, but she found out that by looking at the clays and looking at these ceramics in a scientific way, that they can be clearly linked to the southern um, Iraqi port of Basra, um, which was the entry point uh, for the Chinese and Indian Ocean trade to the Abbasid world. And so we're talking here eighth and ninth centuries. And so in a sense, this is what this is a paper that talks about a much earlier um, time frame than what we've discussed so far. But it also talks about materials in another sense. So it talks not only about the port city of Basra, but about the ceramics that were produced there and that were actually traded all over the Indian Ocean and all over the Mediterranean, particularly the luster wares. Luster was an innovation of southern Iraq. Um, that's ceramics that are um, overlaid with a metallic um, overlay after glaze in order to make them glow in a golden and, and sort of um, iridescent manner. And they were incredibly prized and incredibly popular and examples have been found as far away as Sri Lanka and Spain. So you can see a huge sort of, and also the east coast of Africa. So you have a huge dis network of dispersal of these wares. Now, the ones that we're showing here the blue and white ceramics are very interesting because it's previously been thought that um, blue and white was actually an invention of the Chinese ceramicists, but blue and white was um, already used in, in southern Iraq in the 8th century. And it seems that um, it came to China from there um, and there is evidence of trade between um, the Indian Ocean and particularly the Arabian um, part of the Persian Gulf, and also the uh, 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 sites such, such as Siraf in Iran, 
um, with China through a, a, an important shipwreck called the Bellitung shipwreck of which um, the image here with the um, with with this sort of pattern of, diff of small different bowls, those were all discovered in the shipwreck, um, which was most likely a ship coming from East Africa, carrying Chinese ceramics that were meant for the um, Middle Eastern market. And we know that the traders had connections to Central Asia also because of the finds of gold um, cups and bowls in the ship that had a Central Asian connection. So, so the, the Tang Dynasty um, produced wares for the markets of um, Iraq and East Africa. The markets of East Africa also produced wares, sorry, the markets of Southern Iraq produced wares that were also then traded to other parts of the Indian Ocean and, and the Mediterranean. So, and so this is um, another aspect of, of, of these connections um, that, that we're talking about. And so following up on that, um, this is uh, a series of images from uh, a manuscript uh, that Nancy M worked on, um, which has different versions, um, of course, but it actually um, constitutes basically the um, sort of early modern version of a souvenir uh, and a travel guide sort of, you know, all in one. And this comes mainly from um, South Asia. Um, there are different places within South Asia where the copies of this manuscript may have been um, made. But the idea is you know, um, to sort of help travelers who are going from South Asia on the Hajj, uh, on that pilgrimage, you know, as they make that voyage from the um, port city of uh, Surat, uh, which is on the western coast of India today, um, through the port cities of um, Yemen, um, up through the Red Sea, um, going to Jeddah on their way to um, Mecca and Medina, um, to kind of give an idea of what to expect, you know, what to get in these different port cities, you know, um, what the, the visuals are going to look like, what are the scenes that they're going to see. And so here you're seeing four different pages uh, from different versions of the manuscript um, displayed. Uh, in, in the left, you see um, in stacked perspective, it's what we call when you know people are sort of put on top of each other, but that's really to show recession of space, uh, different uh, folks uh, who are engaged in conversation with each other, who are sitting under a tent space. Uh, you see these lovely camels um, in the painting to, next to it is um, uh, a, a sort of a retinue uh, going to meet the Ottoman Sultan because at this particular time, the Ottoman Empire was in charge of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Uh, and then in the two rightmost images, um, you might find, you know, interesting that the um, there's an aerial view that is composited with ground view as well. And so there's this flattened perspective of uh, the cities uh, that you might see uh, on uh, the sort of the central parts of the cities, um, both sort of uh, in terms of the religious spaces of those cities, but as well as the mercantile centers. Um, and they're kind of flattened together. And here you have these pilgrimage, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving, uh, but these pilgrimage boats, uh, you know, on the side here in the waterways. Um, so you have a sense that this is again, a port city. Um, and it's very interesting, um, the, the argument that Nancy M has made about these manuscripts in her um, chapter uh, to consider that these were more sort of the, uh, our version of what would be considered sort of popular guides, uh, the equivalent of, um, dare I say, Lonely Planet or Baedeker's, uh, because if these had come from an imperial atelier, an imperial workshop, you would have seen something like this. And I think you can immediately notice the difference, which is 
the use or the influence of European perspective um, at the time. And so you see the recession of space very differently articulated here um, as something that is using what we call atmospheric perspective or linear perspective to some degree. There's a blending of both that's happening over here, but not quite the flattening of space as you see here on the right and the left. Um, and so that was uh, an interesting paper by Nancy Ohm. So in the section of migration and diaspora, um, from the section of migration and diaspora, we've chosen um, for today, we've chosen four um, papers, um, one by Ezra Akchan on um, the visual documents of forced migration across the Aegean Sea, um, the, the great exchange between Greece and, and Turkey, um, and the diaspora of, of Greeks and Turks between the two spheres at the beginning of the 20th century. And then Nancy Steinhardt's paper um, looks at a, at a mosque in Beijing and at the history of 600 years of, of its Muslim community. Um, Noha Nasser's paper uh, takes us into the present day and the architectural dialogues that are created across oceans um, in the Muslim diaspora in the United Kingdom. And then finally, the exhibition um, at VCU Gallery, uh, The Sea is the Limit, which was um, curated by the artist Vavara Shavrava, um, whose the focus of which was on migration. Um, and so if you want, would like to talk a little bit about these, um, Radha. Uh, and so the, the first, um, and again, in the interest of time, I'll try to go through these um, slightly um, quickly, but the, the first uh, set of images that you see here are from um, the Greek uh, Turkish um, partition that took place following the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923 at the um, end of World War I and uh, the end of the Turkish War of Independence. And, um, you know, of course, partition wasn't anything new at the time, especially um, as far as European powers were concerned, uh, just two years prior, uh, the Irish uh, uh, island had been partitioned um, into two as well. Um, and we, of course, see the legacy of that all the way to um, present times when it comes to um, the um, from Brexit in particular uh, related to the European Union. Uh, but also the partition in Turkey and Greece uh, related uh, very directly to uh, the partition that took place in South Asia between um, India and Pakistan in 1947. So all of these um, political uh, forced sort of movement of people uh, and divisions of uh, territories, uh, divisions of land and arbitrary divisions in some cases, uh, are uh, very much, you know, um, uh, embedded in sort of the traumas, uh, you know, that sort of that the people have faced during these partitions. And uh, what Esra Akjan has done and very beautifully articulated using photographs as visual documentation and also uh, two uh, exhibitions. One is called the Relics of the Past of the Benaki Museum in Athens. And then the permanent exhibition that you see here on the right, the Population Exchange Museum at uh, Chatalja in um, Istanbul. These, uh, these images and these collections of items really speak to the trauma of the peoples who were exchanged uh, between the two countries. Uh, when you see sort of the politicians who see this as a solution, uh, whereas the traumas that the people face are in some ways kind of erased out of the um, images uh, that they see. And uh, you can also see that there is a difference between what could be taken with them and what could not be taken with them. And so on the journeys on the left, these boats are crammed with people and only with the movable goods at the time, but their houses, um, their places of worship, 
um, their shops, you know, all the things that were not movable were liquidated by each country uh, and then redistributed to the incoming um, uh, migrants uh, from the uh, population exchange. So her paper is really about the, the traumas and the collective memories um, that were generated from that partition. Um, in a different uh, way, the uh, paper by Nancy Steinhardt was really about looking at the um, uh, development of and the growth of the Chinese Muslim population. And she particularly was focusing on this mosque in Beijing, um, which um, has kind of been uh, there continuously for about 600 years when many other mosques in uh, Beijing were either who were either destroyed or moved uh, or refurbished, depending on you know who was ruling and who um, uh, was in charge of that location. Um, and what she sees here as part of mobility and in relation to seafaring is really both in terms of the peoples who are coming in uh, with you know um, the the Quran uh, uh, the um, the, the bringing in the Quran, but also sort of the translation of the Quran in Chinese, um, but also an interest in the stylistic um, uh, migration of uh, mosque architecture. And so even though in the exterior, we sort of see what would we might consider to be a traditional East Asian looking um, frame or structure uh, on the inside, in the way that the space has been um, uh, uh, designed, you really see the uh, incorporation of mosque architecture coming from the Middle East. So she's really looking at sort of the nuances of these um, mosques and the architectural framework of these mosques in relation to the mobility of the people as well as um, stylistic mobility. Um, and then Noha Nasser uh, brought in, you know, sort of contemporary or more, more contemporary uh, material. Uh, for the symposium that we incorporated into this volume. And it's really looking at mosques in the United Kingdom, in England in particular. Um, she started with the construction of the Brick Lane Mosque, which used to be a Methodist, um, uh, a, a Methodist building before, and then was converted, oops, sorry, and then was converted into a mosque with then the creation of the first sort of, you know, um, standalone uh, mosque, uh, the Great Mosque in, in London, and then more recently, the creation of the Cambridge Mosque um, in the city of Cambridge. Um, and what she traces is, uh, along with the construction of these buildings, um, the uh, migration of peoples coming from um, different parts of the world uh, and, and, and sort of um, incorporating themselves into the Muslim community in England at the time, but also the kind of um, pushback that they received, both from uh, others in uh, other communities in those locations, as well as politicians. Um, and more recently, the Cambridge Mosque um, came under um, heavy scrutiny um, because of the associations um, with um, terrorism. And so there, she's really, you know, very beautifully traced kind of the difficulties presented and the challenges presented, you know, uh, for the Muslim community in being able to thrive uh, using, you know, policies uh, that at once suggest, you know, religious um, freedom, but at the same time come with a lot of restrictions. In the, in the exhibition, The Sea is the Limit the title, already implies that the seas are not just um, are not just ways to connect people. There's also the flip side of dividing. And of course, when you think about recent events, very recent events, even going back a few months, perhaps, um, some of which made it into the media, most of which never make it into the media of people moving across the sea to reach other shores um, in hope of a better life. Um, you know, as far away as Papua New Guinea and Australia. Um, of course, what makes it into the media is 
more closer perhaps to um, what's happening between Turkey and Greece, but also Libya and Italy, and the thousands of people that are dying every year. Um, and while this is not the only topic, of course, in, 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 in Barbara's exhibition, um, one of the most iconic works, Susan Stockwell's Trade Winds, um, shows the kind of dichotomy. Um, these, these migrations are, in fact, commercial events in their own right. These people pay vast amounts of money to traffickers in order to get to other places. And this is sort of encapsulated by the fact that these little boats are all made of money, banknotes found somewhere. Um, and the sea is a sea of coins. Now, when we go to the next image, um, one of the works, uh, another work of Susan Stockwell's, was very reminiscent of the depictions of slave ships from the 18th and early 19th centuries um, that went from Africa to the New World. And it kind of depicts the sort of tightly packed um, lower decks of these ships, which were, of course, you know, um, terrible, terrible events um, that were part of commercial enterprises. Um, and it kind of brings us back full circle to the, um, to Ferdinando the first um, and the Quattro Mori in, in, in Livorno, um, which is a monument that glorifies this exchange. But very recently, I mean, I read in the, I think, New York Times um, that a ship was found on a Caribbean island, which they couldn't figure out where it came from. And it had um, decomposed bodies in it with which had died on the way. And it turned out that this ship had actually come from the African coast. This was a boat that was, um, that was full of people who were hoping to get to the, Car to the, to the Canary Islands, um, but they just did, they missed them and they ended up on the Atlantic Ocean and then were washed ashore. Um, on the, on the shores of South America. So this brings us back the tragedy and the trauma, in fact, that is interconnected um, with the migrations that are happening now. Um, and um, so thank you so much. And um, I would, uh, and Radha, we would turn it back to to Uday to um, moderate some questions and answers. Thank you, thank you so much, Jochen and, and Radha. This was fascinating, and I, we could completely go on for another hour because this is just you know. I, and I hope more people will actually um, go through these chapters, go through the volume. Um, and hopefully we can assign it in some of our courses as well so that um, people can delve into some or, um, you know, some of the themes that have come up, especially, um, you know, and also I would say, um, you know, please uh, consider visiting the MIA when it reopens to, to check out some of the, the objects that have been um, displayed there. Um, okay, we have a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see this uh, rather than Jochen. Uh, this is from Mike. Um, Without oversimplifying what's a fascinating topic, uh, subject, uh, can you draw any um, significant parallels between what happened at key moments back then and today? And what can we learn from them? It's a big question. It's a, it's a very, uh, very loaded question. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I can, I can just perhaps just offer um, my, my opinion on this uh, briefly, which is to say that I think um, we see the repetition of many patterns um, 
again and again throughout history. And um, as much as we like to think, you know, that we have reached an enlightened state in terms of where we're going, um, I, I think, you know, we, we're rather far from it and that we need to continue working harder. Um, and I say this in particular in relation to um, the, the pitfalls of globalization that we're seeing, you know, um, currently in terms of um, the, the economic strife, the wars that are being fought over resources. Um, I think all of that, you know, is very much uh, visible throughout history and something that we've seen across, you know, this um, entire volume and something we saw across the entire symposium. Um, and, you know, the toll that that takes um, on the environment, which of course was the subject of our uh, most recent uh, symposium in 2021. Um, so I think, you know, that there are many connections that we can draw um, from history uh, to the present. Um, and it's just a matter of, uh, if, if for conversation's sake, I think it's just a matter of, you know, picking a particular thing that we can then expand upon. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, one thing I always explain to students is that there is a tendency, there's a presentism, which suggests that our uh, version of globalization is, is somehow unprecedented and it's unique. But, you know, when you actually delve into, um, you know, the actually the history behind some of these objects or maps, I mean, you really kind of understand that there are these older waves that continue to shape our present, older waves of globalization. And the world was way more connected than we give credit for. <laughs> you know, and the fact is that we are living in the world uh, with nation states and border controls and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, you know, the only difference in many ways is sort of like, you know, the, the speed, right? Uh, with yeah. which we can connect and which we can communicate. Um, yeah. The 19th century, of course, you know, turned things around in ways that they had never expected then with the railways, uh, the telegraph system coming in, um, you know, the, and, and all of that, of course, changed how people communicated then. And that was supposed to be like, you know, they went from basically zero to warp speed. Um, and here we are, you know, yeah, we can WhatsApp each other, you know, as we're we're having this conversation right now. Uh, but truly, does that mean that anything has changed in terms of you know human connectivity? Um, mm -hmm. Has that has that influenced you know human empathy in a way that we may not have seen in previous generations? Um, I think mm -hmm. that's still much you know under debate. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering, you know, since both of you have worked on, you know, this in different ways, you know, print cultures, as well as, you know, the question of, um, you know, various collaborations, say, between companies, school artists and Indian ones, I mean, that, you know, what are the ways in which when new technologies come in um, to the Indian Ocean region, to South Asia, the Middle East, how do, how do um, existing um, um, you know, kind of artisans and other um, people who, who are kind of creative people, how are they responding in your view? I mean, how, how do you see that in your work? Um, do you see a kind of embrace of new technologies and a kind of um, creative adaptation, or do you see a lot of resistance um, to certain um, new ways of doing things? Yeah, can you wanna? Well, I mean, when we when we think about um, the exposure, for example, of Indian artists to European methods or European ways of seeing European aesthetics um, in the late Mughal period and and the early British period, um, we can see that they struggled. They struggled with it. Of course, the patrons wanted certain things. The patrons wanted things to look the way they were used to things. Mm -hmm. um, and so the artists had to try and accommodate that. Um, some of them really managed really well. Some of them didn't. Um, they, they embarked on 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 themes and topics that they really hadn't um, worked on before, um, and at the same time, you know, you have British artists mm -hmm. um, who start looking at things differently as well. So it's quite interesting. Um, it, I think, also, you know, it just it depended very much on the personality of the artist. Um, the artists were all dependent on their patrons. 
So the Indian patrons wanted a European work, and so they got a European to paint it, um, or they got an Indian artist to copy a European work. Um, the, 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 the British patrons often wanted um, paintings that reflected um, perhaps a much more Indian character. Um, and also they wanted works that, for example, in, the, in, 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 in natural history um, drawings and paintings that showed great amount of detail. And the Mughal artists were surely able to do that. They weren't very good at creating, for example, perspective. Um, so they, they did struggle with that. So there were areas where they were able to adapt more. There were areas where they were able to adapt less. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, and much of that, I think, probably changed then with the establishment of Indian art schools um, in the early 20th century, particularly when you think about um, Rabindranath Tagore, for example, um, mm -hmm. but even also before, when, 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 when these when miniature painting as a traditional art form kind of it goes out of the window um, and people like Rabindranath Tagore really embraced contemporary modern ways of thinking okay. so um, that's also but but I mean if we talk about it in terms of contemporary uh, yeah. work the, the idea of the miniature is revived it's revived. Um, and you see yes. that I mean, in particularly in Shazia Sikandar's work Yes. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about sort of newer technologies, I think they're, you know, um, almost universally embraced as yes. a way for contemporary artists to um, revive these traditional, you know, arts, crafts, um, uh, sort of what we might call high arts also, and present mm -hmm. them, you know, in a different way to kind of, uh, again, sort of suggest a, a continuity with you know tradition while at the same yes. time sort of keeping pace with what is happening yes. in the world mm -hmm. um and i think you know um it's it's just amazing to see what's happening you know it's amazing to see what's happening in the uh, artistic uh, world and especially what's happening here in doha mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's uh, you know i i kind of i i you know this is really important because what you're suggesting is that even in a place like the mia there is a real interest in the past, but in a completely um, perhaps new way. Um, but it, even in, in South Asia, you know, even you, you mentioned Tagore, and, and you know, I mean, there there is a way in which there is an interest in the folk as well as the classical and how they speak to each other. And that is long; it's not a recent preoccupation. It's something that is very much part of what modernism means uh, in the South Asian context. Um, so uh, we have a question here about. Um, um, this is, I don't know if you can see it, this is about the exchange of architects between the Qing and the Mughal empires, and do we see any influence of Chinese architecture in Mughal paintings and architecture, or vice versa? That's an interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say that, I mean, uh, uh, and Jochen, you can answer it too, but I, I would say that at least, you know, from, from my experience, and I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, wholly admit that I'm not a specialist on <laughs> Mughal uh, painting, but from my experience, I think there is the incorporation of elements of Chinese painting that we see, but I don't know if there is um, any direct evocation of Chinese architecture in Mughal painting or the other way around. Um, one of the images that we, we showed um, earlier that was related to the textiles um, and then the painting, the fabrics that we saw, they had um, what are often referred to as Chinese clouds because they have those like scroll-like, you know, images. Um, and that's very much an exchange that, you know, uh, of a motif that took place basically, you know, coming in from China um, and that was very readily adopted and then transformed um, in Iranian art and so Persian art, Persian painting, um, and the Ottomans and the Mughals. But Yokan, you might have a better sense of this than I do. In terms of architecture, I'm really not sure. But in terms of designs, yes. I mean, and, and also, it's, of course, the Central Asian connection. Right. Um, 
mm -hmm. the connection via the Timurids and mm -hmm. Mughals being and being being um, uh, connected, of course, to the Timurids. Um, I am much more aware of, of the presence of Chinese ceramics in, 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 in Mughal yeah. India. Um, and, and also jade, of course, the whole craze about jade is shared between the two spheres. Mm -hmm. um, there are actually mm -hmm. lots of Mughal jades in, in if I remember rightly, in, um, in, in the royal collections in Beijing, or uh, imperial collections, and and then there are also in the Museum of, of Islamic Art here. Yeah. So and there are also then of course the, the Mughals were also um, um, interested in in Chinese jades. Um, there's this giant turtle, for example, in the British Museum that surely um, is something that might have been inspired by. Um, the much more figural jades that, that were quite common in China. But in terms of architecture, I'm not exactly sure. Um, um, the pavilion, perhaps, but the pavilion is something that really is something Central Asian. I mean, it comes from so perhaps a shared, um, a shared idea be between the worlds of China, Central Asia, and the Islamic world. So, yeah, not specific to the Mughal period. Not particularly specific to the Mughal. The world. pagodas and the evolution of that, you know, during the that's all happening during the the Han and later, mm. with the um, with the the transmission of Buddhism from mm -hmm. the Indian subcontinent going up through cent South Asia, uh, Central Asia into China. But yeah, not during. Mm -hmm. the Mughal period. Mm -hmm. Any, any last questions that I know they're mindful that we are over time, but we'll edit everything and you know when we put it up and uh, it'll still be an hour. But thank you for everyone for your patience. I mean, you've uh, this has been fascinating and you know, we can clearly go on forever. Um, I th so thank you so much. Thank you, Radha. Thank you, Yokan, And thank you, uh, Pia and Zabash for um, making this possible. Um, and um, you know, hopefully, We'll be in touch, and feel free to reach out to the to the speakers, and uh, you know I'm sure they'll be happy to hear from you, and uh, yeah, and hopefully we can connect again in the near future. Thank you thank so you. very much for having us again. Thank you, and thank you for all the wonderful questions. Thank thank you very much. Um, take care and have a good weekend. Thank you. you too.